got a little song we say to welcome our guests. Come on, y'all sing it. Clap your hands. something meaningful and life-changing to help you move through the challenges of life? Then join Bishop John A. McCullough II and the Friendship Christian Church of Gastonia for an inspirational message prepared just for you. John 27. I'm going to read the first six verses. So good to see son and daughter here. Amen. Courage, bless God for y'all. They slipped in after their service this morning. The Lord, beginning with verse 1, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I fear? I be afraid. When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war may rise against me, in this, I will be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, Glory to God. He shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place of his tabernacle. He shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing. Yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. And I go down to verse 13. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, my God. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Father, now we, we bless you for this appointed hour. We are your children, your sons and daughters. And we have come to receive of what you have to say to us today. God, your people often bewildered and confused about all of the happenings and, and things that we don't expect. So I ask you to move me out of the way and usher in the power and the presence of the anointed one that I might speak what you have. For we are your people, sheep of your pasture. We need nourishment from you. It's in the name of Jesus the Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Listen, I want to talk about wait. I thought that I had God figured out. Will you look at your neighbor and grab your neighbor by the hand and say, neighbor, wait. If you're like me, you thought that you had God figured out. Turn on the other side or behind you. Get another hand. Say, neighbor, 
Oh, good neighbor. I don't know about you. I'm going to help Bishop talk about ways. I thought that I had God figured out. Amen. Give God a shout while you take your seat. I thought that I had God figured out. I, I thought, that's what I, th I thought I understood all the workings of God. I thought I understood his movement, and yet I come to occurrence after occurrence where he tends to move in a way that I had not anticipated. Catherine of Genoa, a woman of God who was born 1447 and died in 1510. This woman came from a very religious family. Her father had two family members who had been popes in the Catholic Church. She was a woman whose spirituality ran deep. Her love for God was matched only by her love for other people. And she stated in one of her writings entitled Life and Teachings, and, and I quote, she said, the creature is incapable of knowing anything except what God gives to it from day today. If it knew beforehand what God intends for it, it would never be at peace. Y'all see that? The creature is incapable of knowing anything except what God gives it from day to day. She suggests that if if we knew beforehand what God intends for us, we would never be at peace. You see, I thought about that, and we think that we have been around long enough to have figured God out, and that we, even through our prophetic gifts and our patterns of life, feel that we know which way He's coming and which way God is going. But as we encounter life on God's terms, we discover that we don't have him figured out after all. Am I right today? Catherine uh, of Genoa went on to say, I find my mind more restricted upon God every day. It is like a man who at first is free to roam the city and then is confined to a house and then to a room and then to a smaller room and then to a cellar and finally bound and blindfolded until there is no way of escape. With no comfort except in God who was doing this all along through love and great mercy. I came to a place of great contentment. And then put this quote up. She said, God gives us his light in an instant, allowing us to know all that we need to know. No more is given to us than is necessary in his plan to lead us to perfection. Did y'all hear that? God only gives us his light in an instant, allowing us to know all that we need to know. No more is given to us than is necessary in his plan to lead us to perfection. She said, I will not weary myself with 
uh, seeking beyond what God wants me to know. Instead, I will abide in peace with the understanding that God has given me. And, and you know, life will call into question your understanding of God and how he functions. Uh, uh, what do we do when, uh, when we thought that we had God figured out and, and we thought that uh, God would arrange things in such a way that was comfortable for us and, and to our well-being only to discover that there are some things that happen in this life that seemingly can upset our daily routine and way of going about life. There was a character in the Bible who also came to a place where uh, he, uh, he thought that he had God figured out. And, and when you thought you had God figured out and God does some things and some things happen that you don't understand, we got to be just like David. David is one of my most favorite characters of the Old Testament because he was so much like us. He, he loved God. But he had ups and downs, and, and he had all kinds of bends and turns in his life experience, yet he would always find his way back to God, even when he messed up, even when he had to acknowledge that I've sinned and come short uh, of God's expectation. David would always say, I'm making my way back to you, Lord, and, and he wrote of his life experiences in the the book of psalms and and there are songs of praise and there are songs of thanksgiving and there are songs uh, for mercy and for deliverance here in psalm 27 David seems to go through several different emotions now when you read psalm 27 uh, theologians argue as to the idea that it, is it possible uh, that because of the way it's written that uh, there are two psalms that, uh, that were somehow joined together uh, but when you understand life uh, and the reason they question that is because they thought they had God figured out but uh, it is really the reality of life where uh, David through the words at the beginning there is the blessed assurance of thanksgiving for past victories and then uh, the writing indicates that there is still the, the threat of danger ahead. Do I have anybody? You and I have experienced uh, the troubles and the trials and the confusions of this world and, and they often catch us unaware. We experience uh, these ups and downs and we experience problems and we experience hardships and sicknesses and, and deaths uh, in our lives and, and, and marital issues and, and children issues and financial issues. All of this can be classed as trouble. And you thought you were alone. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I know you thought that you were the only one that experienced that. I, I know that you didn't think anybody else in here experienced anything like that. But, but can I tell us that when troubles and trials and confusions come, it's how we as Christians approach them uh, that makes the very difference. Uh, they can almost make you lose your faith. They can almost make you lose your hope. They can almost make you uh, become bitter and angry, especially as you try to make sense of all that you go through and you begin to ask yourself and ask God why. Anybody ever done that? You ever asked him why? David will help us to see that uh, that the only thing that will finally see us through our trials, our troubles, our confusion is confidence in God's ability to see us through. When, when you thought you had him figured out and, and you thought that he would allow uh, everything to just go smoothly and, and, uh, and you thought everything would just flow into sequence and, and move from one phase to the next but you see turbulence along the way, 
we got to go in and join with David. Uh, David was very resolute about this. Uh, he says, uh, in the time of trouble. Now, the first thing I want to tell you that David, uh, David suggested there, there must be an expression of praise. Tell your neighbor, there must be an expression of praise. Whatever you deal with, whatever you go through, when you thought you had God figured out and you uh, uh, run into some uh, circumstances and situations that throw you, uh, there must be some expressions of praise. Now, now David, David said, the Lord is my light and my salvation. You, uh, you got to stop and take into account just who God is. And, and he, uh, he suggests that God is three things. He says, uh, first of all, he is my light. Uh, that is, God is the one who brightens our way, who shows us uh, the right paths, who, who uh, as Catherine of Genoa said, that uh, he gives us light in an instance. And, and Christ said, I am the light of the world. When I can't see my way, when I realize I don't have God figured out, God is my light. And then he said, he said, secondly, he's my salvation. He's my salvation from sin and he is my salvation from trouble. He made a way for us spiritually, and he's able to make a way for us physically. And then he said uh, that he is my strength. And so three things, the Lord is my light, the Lord is my salvation, and the Lord is my strength. When I am weak, in him I'm strong. Anybody in, a, in this sanctuary today with a little weakness? Come on, you got some stuff that buckled your knees. You, uh, you got some news that messed up your mind. You, uh, you encountered some stuff that, uh, that almost blew you asunder. Uh, but you can uh, just agree with David and that the Lord uh, is the strength of my life. Now, now, since God is equivalent to the three things then uh, David suggests, I have nothing to fear. Specific things and known things, whatever it is that causes you to fear, and it's on an individual basis, whatever it is uh, that will push you to fear, I stop to encourage you this morning uh, to join with David and say that uh, I will not fear. I don't need, he said, uh, so I have nothing to fear. And then he said uh, that I, I need not dread the unknown things. Some of us are sitting here and, and, and we're so paranoid about unknown things. We're so paranoid about what if this occurs, what if that happens. I, I don't know if I'm ready for this, and I don't know if I'm ready. And sometimes we are anticipating things that will never happen, and sometimes these things strangle us out and, and stifle us And when we could be uh, living a life of joy and experiencing the beauty of God. Uh, we are dreading unknown things, and, and sometimes you fear the very unknown. Too often people spend their time I'm worrying about and fearing those things, but Romans 8 and 31 uh, says, if God be for us, who can be against us? Come on, somebody. I don't care what it is that might jump your way in the future. If you know God is for you, then you can take fear off the table and understand uh, that, 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 that nothing can be against me. And then I love Isaiah 54 and 17. He said, no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that uh, accuses you in judgment, you will condemn. Is there anybody who can thank God that I see weapons that form against me all the time? I'm walking around and look that they got shotguns drawn on me. It looked like they got arrows pointing my way. He didn't say that uh, the weapons won't form. He didn't say they wouldn't be around you. He said, but I'm not going to allow them to prosper. And every tongue that rises in judgment, you condemn. I wish I could get two or three people who would just rejoice in the fact uh, that I can walk around at peace 
even when I see the arrows of the enemy, when I see him shooting my way, when I see him gunning for me, when I see news that tries to throw me off course, I recognize that it shall not have success in my life. Is there anybody in here? So what, what do the people of God have to fear? David emphasized in verses 2 and 3 uh, that the fact that God was his protector. He said, when the wicked came against me, they didn't come to have lunch. To eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, uh, they stumbled and fell. Oh, God, I thank you. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not. I wish, now, 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 you can't go down this road talking like this unless you have some confidence in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jesus. No, 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 no. Don't you, 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 anybody, have you ever experienced the army encamped around you? You have experienced the fact that the enemies and your foes came up uh, uh, against you and, 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 and the wicked that came up against you. Anybody ever had that? No, y'all been on flowery beds of Eve. You don't understand anything when the enemy is trying to kill your family, trying to kill your life trying to kill your body, trying to take you out of here. It, it, you don't understand that. If you ever understood, though, and host should encamp against me, he said, my heart shall not fear. And he said, though war may rise against me, he said, in this will I be confident. Oh, my God, no matter what the enemy does, the devil comes at us in all kinds of ways. God has promised protection for his own. It might not feel like he's protecting you sometimes, but let me tell you that if God had moved his hand of mercy, you would really know what it felt like not to be protected by God. And God is the kind of God who can protect you. And like my grandmama used to say, through danger, seen, hallelujah, and unseen. Stuff I didn't know that God was blocking. Stuff I didn't see God knocking down. Arrows I didn't see God throwing asunder. He was blessing me in the midst. There were all kinds of viruses coming. There were all kinds of sick attacks coming. There were all kinds of anxious moments coming. But God, somebody say God blocked it. And he wouldn't let it be so. I wish I had somebody. No wonder, no wonder there is nothing... Uh, whatever you're facing right now, I want to tell you there is nothing too hard for God. No, Psalm 121, the first verse said, I will look unto the hills uh, from whence cometh my help, because all my help comes from the, anybody understand that? I'm going to tell your neighbor, I don't know about you, but I'm looking to the hills. I'm looking to the hill, and it ain't Capitol Hill. Is it? Oh, no, no, I'm talking, about, I'm talking about the hills. I'm talking about the hills where the king lives. The Lord will protect you from all evil, and he will keep your soul. The Lord will protect your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. It's the devil's job to make you feel that whatever life throws your way, it's too hard for God. That's his that's his job. That's what he does. Huh? In 1904, the Reverend Steelman Martin uh, uh, and his wife were uh, spending a time as some guests at a, at a Bible training school. And, and Reverend, the Reverend was asked to preach that Sunday morning. And his wife got ill suddenly. And the Reverend didn't know uh, if he should leave his wife, and, and he thought about uh, concerning the engagement, what shall I do? And then his young son said to him, Daddy, don't you think that if God wants you to go preach today, that he will take care of mother while you're away? And the story said that the, the Reverend thought about it, 
and then he went on and after the service he and his wife got back together and they sat down and they started to pin the words of a song that we sing today and they wrote down be not dismayed whatever be time God will take care of you beneath uh, his wings of love abide God will take care of you God will how many of you know it God will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. God will take care of you. Somebody praise him for the fact that he will take care. If God brought me to this, he can hold me in this. I wish I had somebody in here. If God opened it up and it happened, then I know God's big and bad enough that he can handle me while I'm going through it. Do I have anybody in here? And so when you encounter these things, David, David said, David said there must be the expression of praise. And then secondly, uh, there must be the enjoyment of God's presence. The enjoyment of God's presence. All right? Go to verse number four. He said, one thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Now, David, David stated his desire. His desire was to dwell in the house of the Lord. David, in his trouble, was separated from the sanctuary, from the place of gathering, and he longed to be there because he had known the enjoyment of being in the sanctuary. I don't know about you, but that's why I long to get back to the sanctuary of God. That's why I enjoy when I get in an opportunity to worship God together with other believers. David knew the peace of being in the sanctuary, and he desired the beauty and the closeness to God. Now, there is something about getting to the house of God. Some, in the time of trouble, seek refuge in other houses. I'm going to let that sink in, whatever house. What's been the house you've been seeking when you've been in trouble? Verse 5, he says, For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle shall he hide me. And listen, whenever you encounter these times where you thought you had God figured out, and God allows some things to happen that you had not counted on, David here means that his spirit will find refuge with God. He was not talking about running and hiding, but that God has a way of calming your spirit. Does he not? God has a way calming your spirit, it gets racy. God, I didn't think you'd move this way. God, I thought you would have allowed this life to go on. I thought you would have allowed this circumstance to continue. I thought, I didn't understand. But God, well, quiet your spirit. And sometimes we need to just understand. I just need to let him quiet my spirit. When trouble is rising all around you, he can hide you in his pavilion. No wonder uh, David said in Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength. Isn't that right? A very present help in time of trouble. It is the fellowship with God that keeps you. Huh? I said it's the fellowship with God that keeps you. Huh? Oh, to be kept by Jesus. You got to be in fellowship with him 
to keep you. Sometimes we accuse God of not being able to hold us and keep us and care for us going through these situations. But the issue is sometimes we have a lack of fellowship. We don't get in his presence. We don't connect with him. We don't study his word. We don't worship and, and, and honor him. But it's in fellowship that he keeps us. No matter where you may find yourself, uh, get into the presence of God. You know, our foreparents knew how to do it right in the midst of their trials and troubles. They could steal away to Jesus. That thing used to... I didn't understand it when I was young. They used to sing this song, Steal Away, Steal Away at, to Jesus. And I was wondering what did it mean, Steal Away. They weren't just talking about moving to their otherworldly place. They were talking about the fact that in the midst of being a slave, in the midst of oppression, in, in the midst of all kinds of isms, I can right in the midst of that, steal away to Jesus and still be looking at you. I wish I had somebody in here. Yeah, they, they, they could steal away even if they didn't move. No wonder they could sing with joy, I've got a hiding place. Anybody got a hiding place? You can be looking at trouble. You can be feeling disgusted and overwhelmed, and you can move and transition right in the midst of where you're experiencing the trouble. I don't have anybody. David said in verse 6, he said, My head, and now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. David is confident that God was going to give him victory. He didn't say how because he only gives us enough necessary for the current time. and He can move any way he wants. Remember Catherine of Genoa said that and I don't try to grasp it all I, I, because if he allowed me uh, to know everything that he had in store, I would never be at peace because the truth is that there are some things that you didn't think you could ever handle. You looked at somebody else's situation. You looked at somebody else's life and you said, child, if that had ever happened to me, I just don't know how I would have made it. And then God allowed you to go through it and then now you see yourself standing and so don't don't ever say what you can't go through. Don't ever say what you don't want to go through. All I know is God releases enough light uh, in order for us to see what we need for the moment and that he can't give us too much because we can't handle it all right now. Whenever we have these life experiences and troubles uh, and, and trials, we often miss God's blessing because he does not do it our way and in our time. Give it over to God with confidence. Huh? That, uh, that, that the Charles Fold singers used to sing about that problem that I had. Y'all remember that? I just couldn't seem to solve. I tried and I tried, and I kept getting deeper involved. He said, I turned it over to Jesus, and I stopped worrying about it. I turned it over to the Lord, and what did he do? Won't he do it? David brings up praise again in verse 6. There is something beneficial about praise. There is something. Why do you think the devil is always after your praise? Why do you think he's always after your praise? He doesn't want you to praise. He wants you to think about uh, uh, being depressed. He wants you to think about being overwhelmed. He doesn't want you to think about praising God because he knows that there are benefits in praise. David said because he knew the Lord would work it out that he would offer sacrifices of joy. I wish I had somebody in here who would just give God a sacrifice of joy. You might not feel emotionally like doing it, but David said because I know he's going to do it, I'm going to give a sacrifice of joy. Because I know that he's able to do it, I'm going to praise him anyhow. Because I know that when my back is against a wall, 
and I can't seem to find my way, I'm going to praise him anyhow because I know that he is working it out for me. I wish I had two or three people. See, see, there's something about praise. Praise takes the focus off of your trouble and causes your soul to be turned toward God. That's what praise does. Your mind, your will, your emotions uh, uh, make God the central theme when you praise. See, when I can praise, it moves me from the place of where the enemy is trying to trouble and oppress me. Praise summons the attention of God. Huh? When, you, when your child wants your attention, what do they do? They call on your name. And if you don't seem to be getting it, you, you call it a little louder. They call it a little louder. Well, that's all I'm saying praise does. Praise summons God's attention. Huh? That, what? That, that's why David said that God inhabits the praises of his people. And God literally takes a seat. God enjoys the praises of his people. Praise releases your faith. Uh, in true praise, there is joy. And Nehemiah said, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And then you can truly say uh, that when you praise him and you've gotten his attention, he injects something into your experience that will make you say, I feel like going on. Though trials come on every hand, I, something, I don't know what happened, but when I began to praise him, something shifted in my life. When I began to praise him, something came over me, and I don't know, I feel like going on. Though trials come on every hand, I said I feel like, I didn't feel like it before. I didn't feel like pressing my way, but when I started to give him a yet praise, even though there's no fruit on the vine, even though there's no calf in the stall, I still give him a yet praise. And he causes me to be able to ride on the high mountains. He gives me hands, feet that cause me to leap over. Sit. I wish I had two or three. Take your seat. I got to finish here. David said, David said, you can truly say it. In the time of these experiences, there must first of all be the expression of praise. And then secondly, there must be the enjoyment of God's presence. And then the third thing, there must be the exhortation to patience. Somebody say the exhortation to patience. And I'm done. Then he says, uh, now to exhort, to exhort is to urge. It is to advise. It is to encourage. When you go through, David is saying, go to verse number 13. He said, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord. I would have given up. Be advised. To be patient. How can he speak this way in the time of trouble? There is something that has kept David from despair, from giving up. He said, because I would have given up. No matter how dark the night, no matter how difficult the situation, no matter how bad the sickness, you don't have to sink under because God wants to give, go with you the entire journey. He doesn't just want to go with you the last mile. But God wants to help you with the entire load. Not just the last straw. God wants to be your God through your entire life. Not just when you are drawing your last breath. God wants to guide your footsteps from day one. Not just the last feeble steps of the way. God wants to be your sure and safe refuge all the time. Somebody say all the time. David said, I would have gone under except I knew God would bring me through. I've been there. I've been there. 
I almost threw in the towel. I remember coming to that place in, in pastoral leadership where I said, God, I've had enough. God, I, I can't take this anymore. I don't want to go through uh, this anymore. Just let me go somewhere and get on somebody else's staff. Let me, I started looking for positions as a pastor director in somebody else's church. I said, I don't want to have to worry out about budgets. And I don't have to worry about uh, management. I don't, I don't want to, I just go and take care of my responsibility. But I almost went on, except the Lord reminded me that I will see you through. David said it, and I don't know about you, so David began to talk to himself. He knew God was going to bring him through. And so verse number 14, he says, wait on the Lord, oh God, and be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. He said, wait, I say, on the Lord. And that's what I stopped to tell you this morning. Wait, if you're like me, I thought I had God figured out. But I've learned that I got to wait on the Lord. Uh, that's what we need to learn to do. And, and if we know that uh, that's what we should do, then tell your neighbor, do it. In the time of trouble and in the time of trial, in the time of confusion, wait. Somebody say wait. Wait means to remain in one spot, anticipating something. Wait means to be in expectation. Wait means to depend upon. Wait means to stop or pause. Wait means to hope for a great change. In the time of trouble, I just stopped to agree with David when David said wait. I thought that I had God figured out. But since I don't have God figured out, and since God only shows me a little glimpse at a time, the only thing I can do is wait on the Lord and be of good courage. Job said in Job 14 and 14, of my appointed time will I wait uh, 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 until my change comes. Uh, in the time of trouble, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, wait. I know you thought you had God figured out. But God allowed some stuff to crisscross in our life uh, that brought confusion in our mind and sometimes even almost made us doubt God. Uh, but Psalm 25 and 3 says, uh, none that wait on thee will be ashamed. And then in verse 21, he said, preserve me for I wait on thee. And then Psalm 37 and 7 said, rest in the Lord and wait patiently on him. Will you push your neighbor and say, neighbor, wait. You don't have God all figured out. Psalm 62, uh, he says, my soul wait in silence for God and for God only, for my hope is from him. And then I like what Isaiah 40 and 31 said. Uh, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Uh, just uh, don't faint this morning, but wait on the Lord. Don't ever give up because God is not finished with your situation. Don't panic because God has everything under control. Why should a Christian ever panic? For after all, all things work together for good to them who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Why should a Christian ever panic? Because greater is he that is in you 
you that he that is in the world, why should a Christian panic? Because in these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Why should a Christian panic? We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Why should a Christian panic when my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus? Why should a Christian panic when Jesus said, My grace is sufficient for thee? For in the time of trouble, have out your neighbor and say, Neighbor, wait. The devil wants you to give up. The devil wants you to throw in the towel. The devil wants you to be overwhelmed. But I want to encourage somebody wait on the Lord and be of good cheer because it ain't over yet. I remember telling you once about the story uh, about uh, uh, this painting that is over in a gallery in London. It's a painting of uh, Mephistopheles, who is the devil, and a man by the name of Mr. Faust. Uh, now, uh, the, the Mr. Faust, uh, the painting says, uh, who sold his soul to the devil. And the picture is hanging in the gallery over in London. And above the picture, they are seated there and they're playing chess. And when you look at the title of the painting, it says checkmate. When checkmate uh, is given, that means it's over. And so I want to tell you today that uh, this man, uh, they, they had a group that was touring this gallery. And in the group was the chess specialist uh, from Russia. And so as they were going through, they were looking at all of the pictures in the gallery. And uh, they came to this picture of Mephistopheles and Dr. Spouse. And the devil had that evil look. And it said, checkmate. And, and so uh, this uh, chess expert was examining the picture. And uh, uh, while the other group moved on down the gallery, they started looking at other pictures. He was still standing there, and he was checking out this picture. And he, he watched it, and he observed it. And then he started hollering and screaming, and the people came running. Uh, this chess expert said, it's a lie. It's a lie. He said, the king has another move. In other words, uh, the picture said checkmate, but upon deeper examination, uh, Dr. Faust recognized that it wasn't over, that his king still had another move. I just stopped to tell somebody this morning that it's a lie this morning. You got another move. I just stop to tell somebody it's not over. The king has another move. Your finances may be wearing you down, but the king has another move. Sickness may be hitting your body, but the king has another move. Uh, yeah, you might be going through discouragement and disease, but the king has another move. Your marriage might be in trouble, but the king has another move. Your children might be acting crazy, but the king has another move. The job might be laying off, but the king has another move. Lift up your head, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors. The king of glory shall come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. He is the king of glory, and the king got another move. Half out your neighbor, say neighbor. The king has another move. How do you know McCullough? Because one Friday evening, the devil thought it was all over when he threw the auspices of the Romans and the plot of the Jews led Jesus up to Calvary. He thought it was over. He started saying checkmate when they had Jesus hang. He said checkmate when Jesus hung his head and died. 
He said, checkmate when they put him in a borrowed tomb. He said, checkmate The devil said, we got it. Death said, I'm going to hold him. But the king had another move, for it was early Sunday morning. The king took his move and got up out of the grave. Your case is not over. Your case is not done. The king has another move. Say yes. Say yes. When you know you don't have God figured out, don't you worry. Because the king has another move. I know they wrote you off. I know they said it was over. But aren't you glad the king has another move. Say yes. Say yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I said the king's got another move. The king's got another move. They may have said, check out about you, but it's a lie. Tell your neighbor, it's a lie. It's a lie. It ain't over. It's a lie. God is able. When we recognize, when we recognize that we don't have God figured out, we don't know all the inner workings and what's going to happen next, but when there's the expression of praise and when there is the enjoyment of God's presence. And when there is the exhortation to patience, you can be like David and say, I'm going to wait on the Lord and I'm going to be of good cheer because he will take care of me. Whatever it is I'm dealing with, when I don't know the next move, I know it's a lie from the devil. Because the king got another move. Come on, give God some praise. I said, come on and give him some praise. I dare you to give God a praise. You might, you might be sitting on some trouble. You might be going through something right now. You might be backed up against the wall right now. The devil has checkmate over your situation. But I want you to give God. And it's a lie, praise. When I dance this time, it's, my, it's a lie dance. When I shout this time, it's, my, it's a lie shout. When I run this time, it's, my, it's a lie. Because the king has another move. I'm going to give you about 30 seconds to get you a praise on. This is your, he got another move in my situation. Come on, one, two, three, let's go.
You better give them a praise on credit. And I'ma give you this one. I'ma give you this one, God. dynamic worship, inspirational teaching, and a friendly atmosphere, you can visit us on Sundays at 221 West Bradley Street in Gastonia, North Carolina. For more information about our ministry, you can call 704-865-9016. To order your personal copy of today's message or any other broadcast, please call 704-865-9016 and indicate the broadcast date. Or you can just visit us online at www.friendshipgastonia.com. Thank you for tuning in to today's broadcast with Bishop John A. McCullough II and the Friendship Christian Church. Make sure you join us next week at the same time. And remember, let God take control and let the Spirit flow.